Yeah. <laughs> great, great. I guess maybe it, it might make sense to maybe send a note to Dr. Nalapa. I I, I'm doing it right now. I'm oh, doing okay. it this week. Yes, yeah, thank you. So, Martin, can I uh, try my PPT? Yeah, or are yes, yeah. absolutely. So I wanted to ask, would you like me to operate the slides for you or do you want to share no, your No, I think it would be better for me to operate. But I, I okay, haven't sure. tried it at the Google Meet, so uh, yeah, I'll So try. At, the, at the bottom of the screen, the screen sharing button is uh, two, two left from the, uh, from the yeah. red hang up sign. So you should be able, so it's, it's, you should see six icons at the bottom, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I see your slides right now. Okay, yeah, great. So, uh, yeah. I'll try it. I'll do that. Yeah. Because I haven't tried that. I haven't been using Zoom. You know, it's the first, not the first time, but the Google Meet is not, uh, you know, widely used uh, in, in Korea at this time. So, good. So, in, in Taiwan, there has actually been a blanket ban on use of Zoom among all uh, civil servants. And oh. it, was, uh, it was motivated by a decision of the executive UN, the Department of Cybersecurity, from April 2020. Because at that time, there were reports showing that information on Zoom was routed via Chinese servers. Yeah, yeah. Heard of and given, given Taiwan-China tensions, that was something that uh, the executive UN couldn't accept. So um, even though technically our organization is not covered by, by, this, uh, by this regulation, since we're a private think tank, uh, we still usually work with Google products okay. in light of that regulation. I see, I see. I, I'm not sure about Korea, but today is actually the last uh, working day for us in Taiwan before a week-long Lunar New Year holiday. So, oh, yeah, uh, same I'm, thing here. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that we can uh, wrap up this year with with this great event, and uh, <laughs> yeah, hope that the tiger brings us all a lot of safety. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had a little bit of, um, I guess, um, some uh, issues with, with actually determining the day, <laughs> you know, because it's uh, January 28th in Taiwan, and here it's still January 27th. So I hope that uh, Monica didn't make the same mistake. Oh, ma make the same mistake. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, this is another colleague of ours from NextGen. And um, also, just so you know, uh, I, my colleague has just informed me that we are live already. So uh, okay. let's give, I, I'll give us uh, two or three minutes and, and uh, I definitely want uh, Dr. Nalepa to join. But uh, uh, yeah, we will, we'll be starting very, very soon. Sounds great. So as I'm aware of it, uh, some of our audience members might have already tuned in. Uh, thank you so much for joining this inaugural episode of Taiwan Nation Foundation's new webinar series on human rights. Uh, we will be starting uh, very shortly. We are still waiting on one panelist to join us, uh, but we are almost ready. Okay. Good evening, Dr. Naleta. Can you hear us all right?
Dr. Nolet, I think you're uh, on, on mute. I just want to make sure that uh, we can all, all yes. hear each other before we begin. Yeah. All right, can you hear us well? Yeah. Fantastic. So uh, once again, thank you so much to all three of you for joining us this morning or this, this evening, depending on uh, which time zone you might uh, happen to find yourself in. Uh, my name is Marcin Jerzewski. I am a research fellow at Taiwan Next Gen Foundation. And I have the pleasure of being your uh, moderator during this inaugural episode of our new webinar series on human rights. We decided to dedicate the first episode of this new series to trans transitional justice in 2022, given that it is a particularly timely topic in Taiwan. Uh, scholars of transitional justice in the Taiwanese context have often argued that transitional justice proceedings have only truly begun in Taiwan in 2016, following the, uh, following the most recent transfer of power uh, with the establishment of the ill-gotten party assets committee and the transitional justice commission. Uh, recently, we have also seen the news of uh, Taiwanese president Tsai Ing-wen giving a speech at the inauguration of Taiwan's first presidential library dedicated to Jiang Jingguo, uh, the leader who was firmly connected to uh, Chiang Kai-shek's regime as his son, but also someone who is often touted with uh, lifting the martial law and uh, to some extent ending the period of, of white terror. Something that uh, we like to emphasize at Taiwan Next Gen Foundation, however, is that even though Taiwan might be an island nation, it does not exist in a vacuum. And therefore, uh, we brought to you a group of terrific experts who uh, will be able to move from their case study countries, namely uh, South Korea, Lithuania, and Poland, and uh, allow us to engage in a discussion of how uh, these um, comparative perspectives in transitional justice can inform um, dealing with the past in the Taiwanese context as well. It is also uh, a huge honor to have two experts from Central and Eastern Europe with us uh, during today's webinar, especially in the context of an unprecedented new fund openness between Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe. Well, uh, without further ado, let us start uh, the uh, today's discussion. And uh, with us is also uh, Mr. Guanting Chen. Guanting Chen is the Chief Executive Officer of Taiwan Next Gen Foundation. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Different level, and therefore has a um, particular interest in transitional justice and its uh, importance for maintaining high quality of democratic governance at uh, different levels of, of administration in Taiwan. So uh, Guanting, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, dear Dr. Tim, uh, dear Dr. Goodright, dear Dr. Nakpov, and dear guests, uh, thank you very much for joining the new episodes of Taiwan Action Foundation's new webinar uh, series focusing on human rights. Uh, in this first episode, we will explore a topic of particular importance to Taiwanese democracy transitional justice. From 1949 to the end of Cold War era, the KMT, uh, Kuomintang, under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek and his son, Jiang Jingguo, ruled the Republic of China, Taiwan, under martial law. The martial law decrees gave the government immense power to crush any perceived forms of dissent in society. As a result, the KMT imprisoned tortured and executed thousands of people over the course of several decades. Now, President Tsai Ing-wen and the Democratic Progressive Party are investigating the atrocities committed during this era. With the establishments of the Yogurtan Party as a set settlement committees and transitional justice commission, the Thai government hopes to bring historical truth and justice to Taiwanese society and hold the KMT accountable for its action during the authoritarian period. Despite good intentions, progress has been slow due to the legal delays, um, a, controversy, a controversy regarding um, informed and the population's ambivalence. Nevertheless, uh, Taiwan must uh, deal with its history in order to move forward as a democracy. Despite have having been subject to one of the longest periods of martial law in the world, Taiwan successfully transitioned 
from um, bureaucratic military authoritarian religion to vibrant and the competitive democratic systems. The nation made uh, significant progress in uh, bolstering human rights while promoting transitional justice as it seeks to uphold the values of freedom and democracy while redressing judicial wrongs. Uh, moreover, the launch of the National Human Rights Commission in August 2020 constitute an important milestone in strengthening Taiwan's infrastructure for safeguarding human rights and facilitate the government's commitment to meet uh, the Paris principle despite the country's exclusions from the United Nations system. At the same time, some difficult human rights issues remain unsolved. Non-discrimination against vulnerable groups and migrant workers in particular remains another key area uh, where urgent improvement is needed. COVID-19 pandemic has uh, fostered sunlight on the difficulties faced by vulnerable groups uh, in Taiwan and raised questions about human rights compatibilities of response to the crisis. It is important to recognize that these issues do not exist in a vacuum and are also present in other society by bringing together experts with diverse professional and geographic backgrounds. This series will allow the organizers to highlight the success, challenges, and lessons in incorporating human rights into developing sustainable, safe, and peaceful societies and create a platform um, for exchange between Taiwan and its partners in Asia Pacific region and beyond. It is terrific to have Dr. Tim uh, of Korea University among our speakers this morning. Given the similarities in their respective historic, histor historical trajectories, as two former East Asian industrialization oriented authoritarian regions, Taiwan and South Korea are inevitably catastrophic in comparative politics. And this applies also to Taipei's and Seoul's tools in dealing with issues related to transitional justice. Um, nevertheless, unlike South Korea, Taiwan never saw uh, trials of key uh, protectors from martial law era. In Taiwan, the Kuomintang has retained an important position within the context of our country's two-party democratic system ever since the Chiang Kai-shek region moved to Taiwan in 1949. In Korea, the constitution has been revised nine times since the Republic of Korea was inaugurated in 1948. Um, and the current civilian, uh, civilian government established in the 1990s represents the country's uh, sixth republic. I, for one, look forward to uh, learning more from Dr. Kim's remarks. Um, additionally, given the uh, new form and uh, frankly, unprecedented openness in relations between Taiwan and Central and Eastern European countries. It is great honor to welcome uh, Dr. Dovilin Podrecht uh, and Dr. Monika Nalepa among our speakers. Uh, the two scholars will discuss the case uh, of transitional justice in Lithuania and Poland, respectively, as Taiwan uh, went down its path to democratization. We, we closely look uh, at the transitions in the East of Europe. Uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner and former president of Poland, Lech uh, Walesa, came to uh, Taiwan in 2000 to attend the inauguration of President Chen Shui-bian, the first directly elected uh, president of uh, our country uh, outside of the Nationalist Party, TMT. In 2004, inspired uh, by the Baltic chain, approximately 2 million Taiwanese people from the 500 kilometers long human chain from the harbor of Geelong, Geelong um, Taiwan's north, north city, to southern tip at the Pindong County, to commemorate uh, the T2A incident, to uh, call for peace, and to uh, prote protest the deployment of uh, missiles by the People's Republic of China. Uh, and at uh, Taiwan along the mainland coast. It is also important for us uh, to check in with one another and evaluate uh, the state of democracy, democratizations, and transitional justice in uh, cross region context. Taiwan National Foundation has proudly dedicated itself to making Taiwan a more sustainable, diverse, and inclusive place. Transitional justice is generally promoted on the basis that it ensures the diverse sectors of society are affected by conflicts, 
uh, conflict are included in the process of rebuilding societies after conflict and authoritarian rules. Consequently, the topic of today's webinar is very important to our team as inclusiveness in transitional justice in both entering um, webs of power uh, dynamics between uh, individuals who have uh, fluid political and social identities dynamics, which uh, we critically explore in our work. Before I conclude, I would like to extend my gratitude to Mr. Martin Zorinsky, today's moderators um, and creator of this new webinar series for uh, his tireless efforts on this project. And as well, uh, we as we enter the holiday season in Taiwan, I would like to wish you all uh, an inspiring, rewarding, and safe Lunar New Year's uh, of the Tiger. I, um, I wish you all a very fruitful discussion and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guanting, for your opening remarks and introducing our audience and also our panelists to our new series. Um, so now, without further ado, we can move to the uh, most important part of uh, today's program, which are individual opening remarks by our three panelists. And in the remarks, we will follow the order on the poster. So starting with Dr. Kim and then uh, Dr. Budrite and then Dr. Naleta. Uh, so uh, I will introduce our uh, panelists before their uh, presentations. Uh, as a reminder, you have about uh, 15 minutes for your, for your opening remarks. That should leave us ample time for uh, discussion and also to address questions from the audience. So um, Dr. Uh, Hun Jung Kim is a professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Korea University. His research interests include human rights, international norms, and the US-China relations. He is the author of uh, Massacres at Mount Hala, 60 Years of Truth Seeking in South Korea, published by the Cornell University Press in 2014, an account and accountability, corruption, human rights, and the individual accountability norm, published in International Organization in 2014, as well as the prospect of human rights in US-China relations, published in International Relations of the Asia Pacific in 2020. Dr. Kim is currently working on studying diverse strategies of East Asian countries responding to the rise of China. He is also examining a long history of human rights violations and transitional justice in the Korean Peninsula since 1910. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for joining us this morning from Seoul and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen first. Um... Great. Uh, thank you very much for in inviting me to this uh, a very meaningful, uh, very meaningful. Um, so it's shared, right? Okay. It's working. Okay. Yeah, meaningful events, and then uh, also uh, I'm very honored to be here with uh, Bill and then the Monica, uh, uh, who I've been uh, familiar with their work, uh, and then uh, very honored to be here. Uh, so I was in Taiwan in 2019, uh, and then that was also the time when I was there to share the Korean experience at the Academia Sinica, and then I visited the Human Rights Museum at that time. And then because of the at that time we had a very good discussion about what we can learn from each uh, from Korean experience and the Taiwanese experience recently, and then uh, we further decided to go on the have more uh, communication. However, due to COVID-19, the the communication has been blocked uh, for about two years. And then I'm really glad that we are starting this communication again after the Taiwan with the uh, CPAS and then also the TJ uh, committee starting to uh, you know have some progress so far. So today's topic that I'm going to address is uh, transitional justice in South Korea. And then as uh, introduced, I'll probably spend about 15 minutes on this presentation. So my presentation has an overview um, uh, uh, part of the Korean uh, transitional justice, and then also have a uh, some implication of the Korean transitional justice. But before, let me just share with you uh, the Korean uh, what kind of uh, political transitions that the Korea had. So the South Korea's recent history has been marked by the extremely dynamic process. You know, as with the Taiwan, uh, with the multiple political transitions. So this figure uh, shows the major regimes and unrest the political transition, and even war here. 
So if you can see here from 1910, we had a Japanese colonialism and then liberation in 1945, and then the US military rule for three short years, and then the dictatorship of Liu Xingman, which is a patriarchal dictatorship, and then the military coup in 1960, and then Park Jong-hee, which ruled about 19 years. And then again, the, again, the similar coup uh, continued with the Chen Duan, and then uh, you know, institutional democracy in 1987. So anything that has been done actually started after 1987 uh, with the institutional democracy. At this time, there had been some major transitions. So if you can see here, the transition from liberation, from the colonialism, and then independence, you know, actually from Japan, also from out of the US, uh, colonial, US occupation. And then we had the Korean War. So we had the armistice, uh, which is another form of political transition. And then we briefly had a uh, democratization since Lee Sung Man, uh, but it's very short lived, just one year democracy. And then another coup. And then also after the assassination of the Park Jong Hee, we had a, a time called the Seoul Spring, which is a very short lived, uh, you know, about two months uh, period of opening. But again, that ended with a coup. And then actual democratization happened in 1987. So if you can see here, it's very multifaceted and then it's multi-layered, and then with the different types of uh, regime, and then different types of human rights violation, and then also you know, different types of political transition. So this is a history. Well, it's very difficult to summary all these things in one uh, shot, but uh, I'll try to show uh, some implications uh, of the South Korean examples. So let me first address to you what kind of major human rights violations were there. Uh, the, the purpose of this slide is to show that there has been a different kind of human rights violation, and then there has been a different uh, aspect, you know, different perpetrators, and then also different victims, and then different scales uh, of human rights violation. So during the colonialism uh, from 1910 to 1949, uh, you know, these are the clear examples. So we had the resistance movement, uh, the March 1st movement, uh, 7,500 killed, uh, 16,000 uh, wounded. And then the forced labor, which Taiwan also had, uh, we had uh, about uh, uh, 150,000. And then also the issue of the comfort women, which is a sex slave by the Japanese military, which also Taiwan had. So this is uh, the first human rights violation that the Korea experienced in the modern history. The second one is uh, during the US military occupation, and then uh, at this point, the Korea was at the time of the nation building out of uh, the Japanese colonialism. And then because of different ideologies, there has been ideological debates uh, around and the confrontations. And then that ended uh, some major uh, political unrest domestically, which ended about 10,000 killed, and then sometimes at uh, 30,000 killed, uh, mostly the civilians. And then during the Korean War, which marked the highest uh, you know, combat ki uh, killed, but also with the civilians uh, killed within uh, three years. So there had been uh, some civilians killed, about 300,000 uh, killed at one instance. And then also the many, many small incidents, like uh, you know, the, some killings were done by the Korean military, you know, sometimes done by the US military, which is a Nogun Lee, which is a, uh, which is a famous one now uh, because of the AP you know, report. Uh, and then after that, we had a, a long time, the non-democratic regime. And then within the non-democratic regime, we had a different human rights violation. Sometimes it's a massive scale, and then sometimes it's very targeted for the political opponents or the resistance groups or the civil society. So every uh, regime had that kind of, uh, you know, uh, important human rights violation. I think one of the uh, the most distinct one is what happened in Gwangju in 1980. I think many people in Taiwan have seen uh, from the various movies that uh, pictures uh, that, that, that portrays the Gwangju massacre. Uh, recently, the one about the taxi driver, probably if you haven't seen that. So 1980 Gwangju, 154 killed, 70 missing, and then uh, 3,000 were injured. So these are the major human rights violations. So let me now move to what kind of transitional justice measures we had. You know, this is just three of them, uh, three truth commissions, which is most prominent 
And then uh, in terms of the size and in terms of its functioning and in terms of popularity or in terms of its uh, effect, which has been most distinct. So the, the first one here is uh, about the suspicious death. And then Kim Dae-jung created this one. And then this was about uh, you know, uh, dealing with the suspicious death during the military dictatorship or the authoritarian regime. And then the, on your left uh, here, this is, this is about uh, the Jeju massacre, which is three, uh, 30,000 people kill, killed. And then this is another uh, big truth commission. And then I think the most famous one is this one on the right panel, which is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Republic of Korea, uh, which is the most, uh, had the most wide mandate and then which has a, had the biggest uh, budget and then also the personnel, uh, which operated about four years. Uh, but these are not, these are three distinct ones, but these are not, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, exhaustive list. I have an exhaustive list of the truth commissions and then the transition justice measures, I, I, you know, in the next slide, but I, I'm not intent to explain everything, you know, but uh, I'm just trying to show you that how many uh, transitional justice measures that the South Korea had so far. So this is uh, 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 the most uh, recently updated ones. Um, but what I want to point out is that in South Korea, the various measures have been used and then to address the various human rights violations that happened in the various time period. Okay, so I, you know, categorize them as a Japanese colonialism, internal unrest, Korean War, the repression by the non-democratic regime. What is uh, characteristic? So first characteristics are the trial, truth commission, the reparations were mostly used in South Korea. So those are three were uh, the most popular measures is that used in South Korea. Among them, the truth commissions, which I marked in red, is the most popular measures that have been used in South Korea. Sometimes multiple measures were used to address one incident, or sometimes the TRC uh, K, uh, Truth Commission and Reconciliation Commission, was created to address the many issues. But what is uh, important is that the truth commissions are the most common uh, option that has been used in South Korea. And then if you see here, again, uh, the most uh, truth commission, mo uh, most transitional justice measures were adopted between 2000 to 2008. Uh, that was time when the President Kim Dae-jung and President Roo Moo-hyun, who, uh, who were very sympathetic to the victims, were in place. After 2008, we don't see much development, uh, but with uh, the new administration at this time, uh, Moon Jae-in, after 2000, uh, 2020, we have a new commission again. So that's the, the another characteristic. And of course, we have earlier commissions, like uh, which happened in 1948, 1951, immediately after the, the event. However, most of them ended in failure, uh, was not successful. Uh, because of the, it was not supported by the regime or the evidence, it was very difficult. And whenever they find evidence, the social environment was not that friendly for the victims. So that is the truth commission. So let me go back, uh, uh, let me uh, move now to the implication part. So uh, the first one is that achievement. So what kind of achievement the, the South Korean transitional justice measures had? So I'll divide them into three. The first one is about the truth, Second is about the policy and practices. And third one, which is the most difficult one, is accountability. It's a very slow one. The truth one is that, you know, uh, you know they found many uh, new uh, facts or the so-called truth. Uh, and then, uh, you know, some systematic and then gruesome aspect had been revealed. However, these were not unknown. These had been already known, but the Truth Commission gave them an official status as a truth and then the facts. Uh, so it also revealed some evidence by excavating the, the mass murder sites. So these are the e examples of the mass murder site that has been uh, discovered. Uh, so left one is about the Jeju massacre and the right one is about the, what happened in the Korean War. So the, this excavation was very important because they gave a uh, clear evidence of the massacre and then it was a also relieved the grievances of the victims by letting them know where the the, the, the remains of death of their loved ones were. So these were very important uh, aspects of it. So it's a great thing. 
And then also, uh, in terms of the civic education, the public is now more aware and then more sensitive to the human rights and then the responsibility of the government to address the past crime with all these measures. So second, the policy and practices, uh, in many cases, the official apologies were is issued. And then some, uh, so these are the uh, photos of the official apologies given by President Noh Moon Hyun in, in 2004, and then on the right panel, by the present moon in 2020. So the apologies are given, not given once, but given you know, over and over again, uh, um, based on uh, the, the, the president himself. Uh, so these are the another case of uh, the impact. And then also the government records and the historical textbook uh, reflected these changes. And then now they are, uh, have been incorporated these new findings. And then the politicians and the public officials are more cautious using the terms and vocabularies referring to the past. And then in addition, the permanent institutions has been created. Uh, so this is a kind of a you know, permanent institution, the research institution, and then also the, the memorial sites has been built. So um, because the Truth Commission is a temporary body, so it has to, its work has to go on by the new uh, research institute or the memorial institutes, and then they, these are the new findings. And then the last one, uh, I think it's very difficult one, is accountability. Uh, it's a final and uh, still ongoing achievement. Uh, and then this is a very difficult issue. The Truth Commission recommended the retrial of the victims. Uh, and then some of them have cleared their name uh, of the false conviction of the past. In these cases, the court dropped the Truth Commission, uh, the court used the Truth Commission report, and, and, and then they, they cited them as a critical evidence. I know that the tr uh, in Taiwan, uh, there has been exoneration of the, the former uh, uh, victims uh, by the tr uh, Transitional Justice Committee. The same thing happened in the court uh, by the Korea. Uh, and then these are the, some pictures. Uh, I think the last one is the most famous one. It's a former president, Kim Doohan and Ro Tae-woo, who passed away uh, this uh, last year, uh, uh, had been standing on a trial uh, for their involvement in the Gwangju massacre. Uh, and then some other crimes related. And then in the right panel, you see the many victims who have been cleared, you know, their name uh, of being a spies or the, you know, the rebellions, rebels, you know, those kind of uh, uh, convictions, the false conviction. On the, in the middle, you see that, the, you know, after 70 years have been cleared their names of these false convictions. Uh, the last slide that I have is about the implications of the Korean case beyond the achievement. So I'll just address uh, three things. Well, there are many, but I'll just address three things. So um, in South Korean case, there are more failure cases than the success cases in general. So the Korean victims had many failed transitional justice attempts, and then uh, they also experienced many, you know, um, uh, uh, backfires. You know, the returned and renewed uh, uh, suppression. Uh, this also left the victims with the, defeat, the defeatism and then skepticism and pessimism and then sometimes caution and then sometimes deep distrust and suspicion of the government toward. Uh, and the victims uh, several times, you know, hoped and then they betrayed and then sometimes re-traumatized. So this all repeated over the 60 years. But in sum, it was never an easy process and it still is not an easy process. It's, it's a contentious, conflictual and then contested process, ongoing process at this point of time as well, even after this kind of achievement. But as time passes, we see some progress. So for example, some convergence in terms of the opposition party and the ruling party, you know, agree upon certain things. And then there is some gestures of the reconciliation at the very local level. So we see that thing. So it is moving, but it is moving very slowly, and then it's bumpy road. It's not a very smooth road. Second, uh, linked to the development of the international human rights uh, and then transitional justice movement. What happened, happened in South Korea is not just the South Korean effort. It was linked to the international standard, and then what happened in neighboring countries, and what happened in other country cases. So. Uh, you know, if they're with another international success story, the victims uh, expected more. And then they thought that, that they can go far other than the before. So the Taiwan case, especially the 228 case, had been deeply impacted to South Korea uh, in the course of the developing. Uh, so 
So international human rights and transitional norms are developing, and then activists also all around the world are learning about the processes, right? So the Korean case has some values, yeah, I think, uh, for the Taiwan case too. So I think this was the Korean process. And lastly, the uh, the regimes uh, and then the victims were constantly under attack uh, whenever there has been a uh, regime uh, that has been related to the, the the military, which is a conservative in South Korea, and then especially with the you know still confrontation with the North Korea, the ideology is a very sensitive issue in the South Korea. So the victims have always chance to be a re-victimized uh, by the the renewed suppression, and then the the uh, and then the conservative regime or the another suppressive regime. So there has been you know in the course you know second victimization or the re-victimization of the victims because of their transitional justice work you know so they are not simply repressed by the former massacre but they are suppressed by the their second which is a transitional justice work and they are re-traumatized so um in the course it has been never a once and for all process you know even under kim dae-jung and no mu Young, people thought that you know they have achieved a certain level and it will never be you know uh, shaken again but that's not true it, uh, after the you know conservative regime came in like uh, lim young bak and park geun-hye they were again being suppressed you know not the level of the previous level but they are still suppressed you know in terms of the budget and then in terms of the budget cuts and the personnel cuts and a lot of you know cuts of the support and everything so what is important is that you know uh, it you know we can see that's the same thing in the in the holocaust and then the cultural war case in the united states you know it's over and it's ongoing process uh, and then at this point, I think in South Korea, what was very important was the resilience of the victims who were trying to uh, pursue the transitional justice and then do not be uh, you know, suppressed by and then do not be overcome by the, the renewed suppression. So the resilience part was really, really important. Okay, so with that, I'll stop and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stop my presentation. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kim, for this really thorough presentation. And um, just to very uh, briefly tie it to the story of transitional justice in Taiwan, I would like to point out that the timeline itself, even without uh, going into the particularities of uh, the content of transitional justice mechanisms in uh, South Korea and Taiwan, reveals considerable differences between how the two East Asian democracies have approached the questions of transitional justice. Uh, Dr. Kim mentions that between 2000 and 2008, we have seen a proliferation of truth commissions and other tools of transitional justice. Uh, at the time in Taiwan, we have seen the two presidential terms of uh, Chen Shui-bian, the first president to uh, have come, uh, have risen to that position from outside of the Guomindang. However, uh, given the particularities of Taiwan's semi-presidential system, uh, Chen Shui-bian was operating in the context of divided government, uh, where he, as the uh, one of the executive leaders, had the control of the presidency. Um, however, the legislative UN and uh, the executive UN was still in the hands of the KMP, which uh, limited the possible scope of uh, transitional justice activities at the time. Um, additionally, it was interesting for uh, me and I believe other um, um, people working on Taiwan or who are based in Taiwan to hear about uh, repeated apologies from uh, political elites in Korea. Um, one of the first significant related to transitional justice proceedings in Taiwan took place only on August 1st, 2016, when President Tsai Ing-wen uh, staged an apology to indigenous groups. Uh, the apology that uh, is yet uh, to be followed up on by the second largest party in Taiwan's two-party democracy. So uh, these are definitely uh, very important differences on uh, which we can elaborate further during the discussion portion. But now uh, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, second speaker for today, Dr. Davide Butrete. And uh, just a very quick reminder to all of uh, our uh, audience members on Facebook and on YouTube, we look forward to hearing your questions. Please make sure that you drop your questions in the comment box uh, below the live stream video, either on YouTube or on Facebook. If you follow us on Twitter, you can also pose your questions on that platform by tagging NextGenTaiwan at NextGenTaiwan. Um, so
So now uh, moving uh, to, to the introduction, uh, Dr. Dovile Budryte is a professor of political science and chair of faculty in political science at Georgia Gwinnett College in the United States. She was the recipient of research fellowships at uh, Europa University Viadrina in Germany and the Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs. In 2019, 2018, and 2015, she was a visiting professor at Kaunas Vitotas Magnus University and Vilnius University in Lithuania. Her articles on minorities, women, and historical trauma in Lithuania have appeared in various journals, including the Journal of Baltic Studies, Gender and History, and Journal of International Relations and Development. Her most recent book is Crisis and Change in Post-Cold War Global Politics, Ukraine in a Comparative Perspective, which she co-edited with Erika Rezende and Didem Buhari Gomez, published by Palgrave in 2018. Her other publications include books and articles on minority rights and historical memory in Eastern Europe. She's president-elect of the Association for the Advancement of Baltic Studies. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening, uh, Dr. Budrite, and the floor is yours. Well, um, thank you so much for the invitation. Indeed, it's a great honor to be here and uh, to share my insights. I'm really delighted to do that. Um, and I'd like uh, to start out my presentation with making three major points that I would like later on to expand on in my talk. Um, so point number one, and here I would definitely agree with Han Jun Kim that transitional justice, I like using the term historical justice, is definitely a bumpy road. Um, Lithuania has had a very difficult relationship with the past. Uh, processes associated with transitional justice were complicated and produced mixed results. So therefore, it's very difficult to say that they truly have strengthened democracy in Lithuania and helped to promote human rights. I think this relationship needs to be further explored, further researched. It's very, very difficult to assume that uh, indeed uh, this is the case. Um, point number two that I would like to make is that during the processes associated with historical justice in Lithuania, there has been definitely a tendency to focus on more distant atrocities. Uh, the Stalinist crimes and the Holocaust, um, preoccupation with uh, retrospective justice, not more recent communist past, um, is definitely clearly seen. And uh, I think that it's still possible to argue that in Lithuania we see the conflation of the whole period of communism or socialism um, associated with Stalinism. Uh, and point number three, um, I think it's crucially important to highlight the international dimension of historical justice, uh, which is especially visible in memory politics, which increasingly is seen as part of transitional justice, and I will actually expand a little bit more on uh, the developments in this area. So um, let me start out with a brief historical sketch uh, of uh, historical justice in Lithuania. And then I will briefly outline successes and failures of specific strategies associated with transitional justice processes, including memory politics. And I hope this will help to establish some bases for comparisons. So uh, in the case of uh, Lithuania, there were many occupations, right? So um, the first Soviet occupation took place in 1940 to 41. Uh, and it came with nationalization of property, mass deportations, political repressions. Then immediately after it, in June 1941, there was a Nazi occupation, right? And during the first days of that occupation, there was the so-called June Rebellion when the Lithuanians wanted to restore their independence. However, for the Jews, it was the start of the Holocaust during which we saw massive Lithuanian collaboration. So this is a very, very complicated period and uh, it's very um, difficult to address it in the context of historical justice. And then uh, we see the second Soviet occupation, basically from 44 to 91. Once again, we see nationalization of property, creation of collective farms, uh, political repression. And we see uh, what's very important, probably in the current context, a strong anti-Soviet resistance movement, which lasts until 1953. After 1953, we still see terror intimidation. However, 70s and 80s, we see softer 
rule and uh, the KGB moves away from physical brutality. However, we see increase in surveillance and relatively high levels of cooperation with the Secret Service or the KGB. Um, there's resistance coming from the Catholic Church. Um, there are some dissidents groups, and these groups gain more power uh, when Perestroika takes place. We see the national uh, revival movement uh, in uh, the 1980s. And with the revival movement, we see the beginning of transitional justice. We see commissions to investigate communist crimes. We see memorialization of deportees. We see the beginning of documentation of the crimes of the USSR. So this is a very important period for those of us who study transitional justice. During that time too, again, the late 80s, beginning of the 90s, uh, we also see the birth of what I call fighting and suffering meta-narrative, which very much focuses on the fighting of anti-Soviet partisans. These are the big heroes. And the suffering part of this meta-narrative uh, would refer to the uh, deportations under Stalin. And uh, in Lithuania, to refer to these deportations and repressions under Stalin, we see the use of genocide discourse, which was very much borrowed from the diaspora. Diaspora has been using it since the 40s, referring to Soviet repressions as a genocide, which very much focuses on the aggregate suffering of the Lithuanian nation and rejects allegations of co-responsibility, which, as you will see from my presentation, I see as uh, problematic. So now let me transition and talk about um, specific strategies. Um, so um, the first strategy that I would like to mention briefly would be restitution. And here I focus on material compensation for the past wrongs. It was indeed fraught with legal and practical difficulties, such as historical issues, in addition to the Soviet occupation, in addition to Nazi occupation. There was also a Polish um, invasion from 1920 to 39 of Vilnius and surrounding areas. So therefore, restitution was extremely difficult to pursue because it was simply unclear who was the owner of property. However, by 2009, restitution claims of private individuals were addressed. Uh, but uh, however, there were questions about communities, was to do with communal restitution. Here I would like to mention one success. Uh, in 2011, uh, Lithuania established the Goodwill Foundation with, uh, and that Goodwill Foundation transferred 37 million euros to the Jewish community to promote Jewish culture. It was part of Lithuanian Jewish reconciliation. And I think by and large, there has been a lot of progress in that area. Um, however, there are remaining issues, which is to say restitution of private property to um, Lithuania's Jewish community and uh, their descendants. The second strategy that I would like to briefly mention was rehabilitation. And uh, in 1990, um, there was an attempt of reconstitution of legal rights of people repressed for resistance to the occupation regimes. However, it was clearly stated that there will be no rehabilitation for those involved in the Holocaust and Soviet repression. So um, things were moving very, very fast. 1991, there were thousands of people, 50,000 to be exact, rehabilitated. However, there was a lot of international uh, pressure. There were questions asked about those who collaborated with the Nazis, who participated in the Holocaust. So there was a process of de-rehabilitation and several hundred of people um, lost their uh, victim status uh, because of their involvement in the Holocaust. Um, in 1997, there was a commission created uh, that was focusing on the rehabilitation of the rights of resistance fighters, freedom fighters, victims of the regime. Um, and uh, around that time, also uh, late 90s, there was this very clear trend of linking post-war resistance and many people were these resistance fighters, freedom fighters, they got all of these um, names. Um, there was linking of this post-war resistance to statehood and the partisans were very much called to be heroes of the nation, state leaders. However, uh, currently um, we see how many problems there was with that process because right now there are mnemonic conflicts 
focusing on some of such heroes, anti-Soviet resistance fighters, who actually uh, were found to participate in the Holocaust, and and this was this is indeed very much a cause of emotional outbursts and mnemonic wars in the Ukraine right now. Um, the other strategy that I would like to mention briefly was illustration. Uh, once again, it was very uneven. It was stronger when right-wing forces were in power. Um, the problems were inadequate documentation. Uh, and um, in 1991, 1998, and 99, um, there were processes of partial illustration. Um, some former KGB collaborators were offering confessions. Uh, those who offered confessions were allowed to pursue their employment, etc. Um, there was an attempt to publish uh, a list of KGB reservists. However, again, the information was incomplete and it caused many upheavals in society. And um, the process was never complete. And again, there was definitely, definitely questionable success of this. Um, the other strategy that I would like to briefly mention would be the strategy of criminal trials. Um, Lithuania has not attempted to criminally punish high-ranking leaders of the former Communist Party or other officials responsible for maintaining the Soviet system. Instead, it focused on retrospective justice associated with the Soviet crimes, the so-called Soviet um, genocide. Um, Clearly, a big issue associated with this problem is how to collect information about the crimes that took place decades ago, and there's also huge politicization of the issue. Um, and also, Lithuania was reprimanded many times for inadequate attention to the Holocaust crimes, but instead it uh, focused on the Soviet, um, Soviet crimes. There were quite a few cases initiated, according to my um, data, as many as 91 in 2018. However, very few actually reached the pre-trial stage. And again, lack of reliable information, dead witnesses was a problem. However, here I would like to briefly mention one victory, again, to some quarters, in, tw in 2019 uh, in the European Court of Human Rights. There was a case, Drelingas versus Lithuania, regarding the killing of the Lithuanian partisans, those anti-Soviet. Uh, fighters, um, they were considered to be a significant part of the national group, and therefore the court indeed ruled that those actions against the Lithuanian partisans were considered to be genocide. So for the right-wing quarters in Lithuania, that was a big victory, and that once again resuscitated this um, worship of, of, of those anti-Soviet heroes. And lastly, I would like to talk a little bit about the symbolic dimension of the historical justice, uh, memorialization, and truth establishment. Um, just one general remark that Lithuanian policies of remembrance uh, are less revealing the complexity um, of uh, the events of the past, um, less interested in deconstructing the fate of individuals, but instead there definitely has in the past been a focus on remembering the aggregate suffering of the entire nation and uh, up until recently probably rejection of accusations of co-responsibility and involvement um, in occupation regimes. Um, so um, even though, again, um, memory politics are very often considered to be integral parts of transitional justice, if those memory practice tend to focus on the aggregate suffering of the nation, I think that uh, this can definitely undermine the goals of historical justice, such as reconciliation. And very often, this is precisely what has happened in the case of Lithuania, as we witnessed many memory wars, such as the tensions over Jewish partisans who cooperated with the Soviet partisans um, and uh, other memory wars over the anti-Soviet partisans who participated in the Holocaust. So um, here, um, the international dimension um, should be highlighted as well. Lithuania attempted to push for its um, uh, genocide agenda internationally. Um, and uh, also, I should mention that there were memory laws passed by the Lithuanian parliament in 2010 that basically issued punishment for denying Nazi and Soviet crimes. The punishment was used only once in 2013, 
when Algir Despelecki, a Lithuanian a politician, uh, was fined for making an argument that in 1991, when the Soviet military attacked Lithuania, that Lithuanians were killing themselves. And uh, he basically was denying the fact of uh, the um, Russian aggression. Um, there were several other cases, but they did not really end in fines. Um, but nevertheless, those memory laws do exist, and they represent an attempt to uh, criminalize certain versions of the past. Uh, when it comes to the international dimension, I would also like to mention that indeed there's an international commission to address the crimes of both regimes. Um, Lithuania, once again, has been very active in trying to promote the condemnation of Soviet crimes in European institutions. Um, and um, I will conclude with saying that um, despite all of these memory wars, there have been several positive de developments in remembrance, just like it seems to be the case in Korea, there is now increased awareness of the suffering of others. And one can only hope that it will lead to empathetic emotional engagement, which is supported by international actors. The international actors support initiatives by, let's say, the Lithuanian Jewish community to engage with other communities. And uh, this awareness of the suffering of others definitely, um, I hope, in the future will help to go beyond this focus on the immediate community of suffering, which has been a part of the process of transitional justice and also made it complicated and impeded it somewhat. So I'll stop right here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vudrite, for introducing the case of Lithuania in our discussion of transitional justice. Uh, before we move on to Dr. Naleta's presentation, I would just like to very brief, briefly comment on three points that uh, really um, stood out in your presentation with uh, regard to the case of Taiwan. Uh, firstly, you mentioned that during the processes associated with transitional justice in Lithuania, there has been a tendency to focus on more historically distant atrocities related to the Holocaust and, and Stalinist rule. And this is definitely a dynamic that we have seen in Taiwan as well, especially in the 1990s, with um, this similar set of mechanisms being put in place for victims of uh, the 228 incident, uh, which took place on February 28, 1947, and in the subsequent weeks. And uh, the uh, white terror period, which essentially describes uh, authoritarian atrocities committed during the uh, period of, of the martial law. So uh, in, in the 1990s, the um, Guomindang has passed three uh, different laws that were uh, related to providing uh, compensation, to providing rehabilitation, both material rehabilitation, but also reputational rehabilitation to victims of the 228 uh, incident. However, uh, the process for compensation of white terror victims was definitely stalled, and we have only seen uh, significant movement in that, uh, in that realm uh, after 2016. So uh, a very different timeline, once again, just as in the case of Korea. And then I thought it was quite interesting that you touched upon uh, diasporic linkages, uh, at least when you talked about the rhetoric used to talk about transitional justice in Lithuania, because associations of expatriate Taiwanese based in the United States, but also in, in Canada, Japan, and other uh, geographical locales were quite important uh, to uh, set transitional justice proceedings in motion in Taiwan. And then last but not least, and this, this comment is also, uh, uh, I believe, uh, prescient of uh, the Polish case, and, and Dr. Naleta's remarks that you're about to hear are, is related to lustration. So uh, lustration is something that uh, has not happened yet in Taiwan, and um, just uh, uh, through uh, sheer uh, geographical connection, I am currently uh, sitting in an office on the boundary between Taipei City and New Taipei City. And New Taipei City is a, uh, an important hotspot for a conversation about lustration in the Taiwanese context uh, because the KMT mayor of New Taipei City, uh, Hou Youyi, was a member of the police force since 1975 and was directly involved in um, the investigation and of uh, Nylon Deng, who is now deemed to be one of the most important figures in the Taiwanese human rights landscape. He uh, self-immolated in defense of uh, freedom of speech and, and freedom of, of the press in Taiwan. 
And um, during the most recent local elections in Taiwan in, in, in 2018, this uh, police past of the, of the incumbent mayor was not really dealt with in a way that many people would find satisfactory. So frustration is definitely an um, area of transitional justice uh, in which Taiwan can uh, collaborate considerably with uh, Central and Eastern European uh, partners. So uh, thank you for allowing me some time to make these comments. And last but definitely not least, uh, Dr. Monika Nalepa will touch upon the uh, case of transitional justice in Poland. Uh, Dr. Nalepa holds a PhD from the Columbia University and is currently an associate professor of political science at the University of Chicago. With a focus on post-communist Europe, her research interests include transitional justice, parties and legislatures, and game theoretic approaches to comparative politics. Her first book, Skeletons in the Closet, Transitional Justice in Post-Communist Europe, was published in the Cambridge Studies in Comparative Politics series and received several awards. She has published her research in top journals, including Perspectives on Politics, the Journal of Comparative Politics, World Politics, and others. Her current work centers on how transitional justice mechanisms contribute to the quality of democracy. A centerpiece of it is the Global Transitional Justice Dataset, funded by the National Science Foundation. Her next book, After Authoritarianism, Transitional Justice and Democratic Stability, is coming out with Cambridge University Press in 2022. She teaches courses in game theory, comparative politics, and transitional justice. Monika Nalepa has also held prestigious fellowships at the Harvard Academy of Scholars and the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School. She's a native of Poland and speaks fluently in Polish and Russian. Dr. Nalepa, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, um, everybody. Um, so let me practice this by saying that I'm neither an area studies specialist nor historian, um, but I do have a keen interest in um, strategies, especially strategies that help uh, sustain uh, both democratic and authoritarian regimes. So uh, I'm going to focus my comments on the intersection of martial law, actually, and the future of transitional justice using Poland as an example. And hopefully that will be, um, that will be useful. So I'm going to start with pointing out that um, authoritarian regimes suffer an information deficit, okay? So in contrast to democracy, it's actually very hard to obtain information about legitimacy, about how popular the, the regime is, uh, how popular is the government, because there are no elections or there are, in other words, no meaningful elections. So there is no information about how resistance is mobilized, uh, how vast spread it is, how well organized it is, uh, or even you know, how numerous it is. And this is particularly uh, relevant for seasoned authoritarian regimes um, that have been around for a long while, for, for a while. And Polish, the Polish authoritarian communist regime was no exception. Um, the, by the 1980s, the, the secret police apparatus was flailing and really struggling to obtain information uh, for several reasons uh, about this size of the opposition. Um, so the first is that they were failing to recruit the best officers. Um, we've uh, been able to obtain data on vacancies uh, in various departments of the secret police, and it's really astounding how struggling these forces were to uh, continue recruiting the best and brightest. Um, they were, for the first time in the 80s, also dealing uh, with an interclass and interregional opposition movement uh, in the form of solidarity. And uh, so those are the theoretical reasons why the secret police was not doing a great job. We also have empirical evidence that they were doing a really poor job because um, when, the, when the communist government following negotiations with representatives of the opposition movement Solidarity actually sanctioned the legalization uh, of the Solidarity trade union, it thought based on estimates from the secret police, the, the trade union would have maybe a few hundred uh, thousand, maybe a few tens, rather tens of, a few tens of thousands or maybe a few hundred thousand members, but not three million. So the, the secret police reports uh, grossly underestimated how dramatic the resistance to the communist regime was. Um, so um, we know that the communist government realized that it had this deficit in, of information um, from uh, one of the actions it took um, 
weeks, actually still during the, the time when the martial law was still in place, which is they created a center of public opinion research. Okay, so they realized that the, the qualitative information that the secret police was providing them with was just insufficient. They realized that they needed quantitative data and they actually created an institute to survey citizens of a communist authoritarian regime and obtain information about their support for the government and the opposition and gave that center full a fully free hand in actually ensuring respondents that they their responses will be treated anonymously. Uh, so that's somewhat tangential, but um, but I'm I'm highlighting this because Tebos is basically a trove of uh, uh, of resources now for scholars of authoritarian uh, regimes. But it also shows that the communists were aware of this deficit. Okay, um, so Tebos maybe solved the quantitative problem of like how numerous the opposition was, even if even if these surveys underestimated at any given time how large the resistance was by <clears throat> collecting trend data, at least they could observe whether it's growing or declining. Um, and, and that is in fact how they use this data uh, because uh, they one of the questions asked in the surveys was for instance, were you at the time when Solidarity was a legal organization, a member of that trade union? And the, the, the true uh, proportion of respondents uh, uh, res who, who, who said yes should have been around 33%. But we actually see it hovering first around 29%, then dropping to 24 and then increasing again. So it was actually a very good measure of, of uh, support for the resistance to the communist regime. But as I said, that was just quantitative information. So where do they get the qualitative information about how organized, what mobilizes this, this movement and so on? Enter martial law. So what does mar martial law do? Well, martial law is, a, first of all, it's worth pointing out that it's a military regime and not a, a, a secret police regime. And uh, I'm, I'm mentioning this because in many countries, uh, especially in East Asia, um, as we know from the work of um, uh, Sheena Chestnut Graytons, uh, the, 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 the secret police and the military are actually separate organizations. However, I would venture to argue that in communist uh, Europe and Central Europe, they actually worked more in concert together. Um, but what I wanted to discuss is the opportunity that one specific policy of martial law uh, created and opened for the secret police, who was that, that was this flaming organization incapable of collecting adequate information. Um, so this, this policy was the internment or temporary arrest of between 10,000 and 15,000 of Solidarity members. Uh, over the span of a few weeks, maybe a, a, a few months, um, so so this gave the uh, so this gave the secret police an opportunity to uh, interview these solidarity members and potentially recruit new informers, um, who uh, who would be then the eyes and ears of the secret police of the resistance to the communist to, to communist rule after martial law was was lifted. And it was a very successful campaign. I mean, just think of, about it, right? Instead of going and recruiting one by one informers, you get this opportunity to just interview thousands of them, uh, often under duress, people who are just itching to go back to their homes, take care of their kids, their parents, whatnot. Many of them consented. And, and I'm very far from judging the reasons for, for which people agreed to provide information or agreed to be registered as informers. But we know as a fact that during the martial law, many more informers were recruited this way. Uh, the point that I'm making is that it was an event that actually allowed the secret police uh, to sort of like renew its eyes and ears on, um, on the opposition. And it had two very important effects. Effect number one, it extends the tenure of the authoritarian regime. Right now it's able to uh, infiltrate a new uh, society. Um, and I know somebody's going to point out, well, the regime fell anyway, but that we don't have the counterfactual of how quickly we would fall without that recruitment of informers. Uh, but here's where transitional justice comes in. As I argue in uh, Skeletons in the Closet, that action also shielded the masterminds of martial law and of the communist regime in Poland from transitional justice. And the reason that this happened is because it created um, for these freshly recruited informers solidarity members, a very strong incentive to argue against transitional justice. Any form of uh, opening the files of the secret police and revealing its activity was very dangerous for these uh, members who were recruited, and not only for those members, but al also for parties that were associated with them and affiliated with them. Um, so as I point out in my first book, Skeletons in the Closet, 
it was also against the interest of post-dissident parties to actually engage in transitional justice. So the prevailing uh, line and the prevailing story in Poland following the transition to democracy was uh, was was calling for the so-called thick line to separate the past from the present and not engage in transitional justice. And this was sort of like sold as well. This is like the Polish version uh, of the Spanish model. We're looking to the future. But in fact, uh, this, uh, this, this burying the past ended up creating skeletons in the closet, which ended up coming to haunt those very dissident members um, of, the, of the opposition later on. So as I argue in my next book, After Authoritarianism, as, uh, as, as Martin uh, quoted, um, what new democracies should do if they want to strengthen their stability is among the two at least two types of transitional justice, transparency regimes and accountability regimes or retribution, they should really invest in transparency because it's the lack of transparency that allows um, all kinds of persons connected with former agents of the authoritarian regime uh, to blackmail leaders uh, with skeletons in the closet. So I'll end there uh, and I'm happy to uh, address any questions. I understand that the this line of reasoning is, is somewhat controversial in my neck of the woods, but um, you know, as a tenured professor at the University of Chicago, I um, I'm trained to make bold statements. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Nalepa, for elaborating on the on the Polish case and its idiosyncrasies and uh, how how the uh, later phase of the authoritarian period in Poland also shaped later uh, transitional justice proceedings. I think that uh, th these calls for a thick line or an uh, appropriation or localization of the of the Spanish model, as you mentioned, um, th this this line of thinking also resonates with um, some of the political elites in Taiwan, as I mentioned. Uh, Taiwan is a peculiar case, as in um, just like in, in Mexico, for example, the former um, authoritarian monopolistic party still plays a, an important role in uh, democratic electoral politics. Um, however, uh, the question of ill-gotten party assets of the KMT or the question of opening of the KMT archives to the public is still is still lingering. So uh, there are definitely uh, parallels on which we can um, uh, we can draw as we try to uh, apply lessons from uh, the case of Poland and also Lithuania and Korea to the uh, to the Taiwanese case. So um, once again, thank you so very much for your uh, for your presentations. I have already uh, some questions from the audience. So with, the, with 22 minutes remaining in today's webinar, uh, I suggest that we move to the, uh, to the discussion portion. And um, I would like to start with a question that has actually come from uh, several individuals at once. I have seen it uh, on Twitter just now. I saw it in the sign-up form. And uh, people are interested in learning more about the nexus of uh, transitional justice and political polarization. Namely, uh, how can we um, effectively use tools of transitional justice to deal with the past uh, without uh, polarizing the society. I understand that it's a broad question, but if anyone would like to start, um, let's let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can I can take that because uh, just, so just last week I had the opportunity of attending um, an amazing book manuscript workshop of Professor uh, Sayan Loyal at uh, Penn State University. Um, and uh, what she's arguing in her in her forthcoming book is the is is, are, 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 is that the the strategies that regimes um, choose when sort of like demarcating what what kind of atrocities will be addressed with transitional justice and which atrocities will not be dealt with transitional justice is very consequential for create creating these regime divides, if you will. So basically polarized communities and a new democratic regime where some people feel they're included in, the tra in transitional justice and their victimhood is recognized and others who are just left out because somehow, you know, it was decided that what happened to them does not fall under the purview of transitional justice. Right. So I think uh, and, you know, I don't want to be over interpreting uh, Cyan Loyal's theory here, and I really encourage everybody who has a chance to uh, to reach for her book when it comes out is that you know making transitional justice more inclusive so actually including you know as broad of a range of crimes as possible uh is probably you know the thing to do to avoid 
to avoid polarization. So you don't have those victims who are feeling, you know, left out. And it's a very expensive process. It's probably a process where, you know, you might have to sacrifice accountability and just focus on truth and transparency. But, you know, that seems to be the lesson that, you know, I came away with uh, on Friday after spending a whole day discussing her chapters. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, especially thank you for uh, drawing a connection between this uh, popular question from the audience and uh, new scholarship that is coming out on the subject. Dr. Budrata, Dr. Kim, do you have any insights on this? Um, yeah, I think I just would like to highlight uh, the importance of transparency. I think it's uh, definitely um, the processes uh, should be transparent and um, um, drawing on the case of Lithuania, unfortunately, in the past, uh, transitional justice was definitely associated with um, nationalist right wing parties. And uh, I think one of the big problems, you know, from the case of Lithuania that I tried to communicate in my presentation was this exclusive uh, focus on the crimes of the Stalinist regimes, deportations, repressions, um, and kind of a little bit of less um, attention to the, the, the other crimes that took place. And uh, so I think uh, I definitely would uh, second what uh, Dr. Nalapa just said, that uh, this approach of trying to be as transparent as possible and trying to be, in a sense, historically as inclusive as possible, not just focus on you know one particular trauma, <laughs> but try to actually include um, multiple historical events seems, seems very uh, promising from what I'm hearing. Thank you, Dr. Budrate. Dr. Kim, would you like to weigh in on this question of yeah, polarization? Sure. Uh, you know, in terms of the polarization, I think we are living in an age of uh, you know, domestic polarization, I think. And uh, I think this discussion about the transitional justice becoming <coughs> one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the factor that, that, that divides the society or sometimes brings a, a big uh, contestation or the conflict or sometimes uh, um, contention within, within the society is a, uh, I think, is a factual thing. You know, I think that's what hap what happened in South Korea. And I think, you know, I see that in the U.S. case. I think in the cultural war case, I think it's a similar and the racial issues. Uh, and then about the past histories, how the, that, that makes society more divisive uh, these days. Uh, but in terms of the South Korea, I think uh, uh, I see uh, two things. The first thing is that um, yeah, I think some controlled or the milder level of discussion or you know, uh, uh, attention to the, the past wrongdoing is a healthy uh, thing for the society because they have to figure it out you know, about the facts and then truth and then what has actually happened and then what are some nonsenses, you know. But I think that up to that level, um, I think that's a, that's a healthy uh, tension within society. And then every socia society has that. And I think that it's kind of a universal aspect. I think when it gets tipped over to the contention is when the political parties or the current political regime are trying to use or to utilize the past in order to take advantage or the some advantage of the current politics. And it, I think that's the one when, when the kind of detrimental effect of the, the past history comes in. The South Korea also has that, you know, because some politicians try to use the past history to make more divisive or try to get more votes uh, on, on, from the victims, uh, from, from sometimes from the victims and from sometimes from the perpetrators or the, or, or, or the conservative regime. So, I think in that particular thing should be really be uh, careful, and I think that level should be uh, prevented if possible. Uh, and I think the role of the media is also really important in order to how they portray the past issues and then how that become a contentious issues. So I think we have to have that kind of certain division uh, between uh, you know uh, this healthy and moderate uh, discussion about the past, and then also the political use of use of the past. But I think sometimes the political use of the event also have a unintended consequence of bringing uh, the past issue with the correct language. Because when the political use of the events are, you know, becomes a more prevalent and happening all the time and becomes popular, there has been also the rise of the, the extreme version of it. 
you know, the radical version of it. So, and then people use, and then those radical exper uh, views about the past are sometimes filtered in, you know, um, sometimes filtered by the, in the course of discussion. So in a way, those violent or the sometimes conflictual discussion about the past also is kind of detrimental, of course, to the pol polarization, but sometimes has a, uh, you know, uh, I think it's a, not, not a good, but sometimes beneficial effect in the long term in terms of the, you know, figuring out what are the radical voices and the, what are the extreme voices and then whether they should be censored in. So that happened in the South Korea too about the Gwangju method thing because the, through the throughout the course of the big discussion, you know, extreme version that it was a control, it, it was a kind of infiltration by the North Korea, you know, there that was one of the radical version of it. And then now that has been discredited in the course of the legal lawsuits and the social debates. So, you know, I think that is how the society should, should go. And I think that Taiwan also has this very similar effect about the transitional justice measures. I know that the, the mind you has been referred to what is the, the Min Xinjiang is doing as a green uh, terror. You know? So that is a kind of term that he's using that the transitional justice issues in order to consolidate uh, or the, in order to resist you know, the, the kind of transition justice uh, efforts that is happening in the Taiwan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it, if you have any comments uh, for, for one another, uh, I will make sure that I give you space, but I just want to cue in the next question from the audience. It comes from a, an audience member in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, related to uh, communication with the public. And I think that um, it also is related to Dr. Kim's remarks about the role of the media. So specifically, uh, Dr. Sang would like to know uh, how in the course of uh, transitional justice proceedings, the institutions re responsible for implementation of these mechanisms should communicate with the public. How can they um, communicate with the public clearly and transparently? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the easiest way to answer that is, you know, the truth commissions, right? Because the truth commissions also, almost by definition, they're successful if they publish a report. I wanted to also highlight, they're not successful if they made it, make everybody happy. In fact, Jim Gibson, you know, one of the first authors of um, uh, actually a trilogy on the truth and reconciliation journey in, of South Africa, did highlight that, you know, in his opinion, the commission worked well precisely because it, pissed, it annoyed everybody. Everybody felt like that, you know, they didn't get, that the other side didn't get all the blame. So I don't think that that um, expecting happiness is the, you know, like the right normative criterion by which to evaluate transitional justice. Uh, but they produce a report, so they inform the public. Um, and, you know, that those reports can then be um, you know, repurposed and made more digestible and, and, and circulate and so on. But even lustration laws uh, sometimes have this uh, communicative aspect. So um, Dr. Budrita mentioned the, uh, the, 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 the Lithuanian um, law, which was based on confessions from um, candidates for public positions and so on. Uh, so I'm not sure what happened with those confessions in the Polish version of that law they would be published in a, uh, in a governmental gazette and uh, they would actually also be circulated to voters in advance of elections so that voters would know whether somebody they're voting on for had been or had not been a, a collaborator. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, for, for transparency regimes, it's almost natural that, you know, that this information will be released. Um, but, but, you know, more retributive forms of transitional justice are tricky because we know that those trials are often very um, prolonged in time. Sometimes they're held behind closed doors. Uh, sometimes they're held in absentia because the, those responsible are too ill to stand trial and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so so for, from, from that point of view also, it seems that you know there are more arguments to invest in transparency than other forms. But I'll let others speak. I don't want to monopolize. Take any, any further remarks on the question of public communication? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so in terms of the uh, the communication, I think the communication happens in a various front. So I think one of the thing I emphasize in the Korean case is the civic education. 
The civic education is not just happening through the revi revision of the textbook or the revision of the text, you know, text within the museum or change of the official government documents. I think that's a formal one. I think the more informal ones are happening uh, by you know, civil, uh, civil society actors and also the researchers, the scholars or the think, think tanks, they publish based on the Truth Commission report. And then sometimes, you know, you know, in South Korean case, a lot of new film, uh, films have been made based on the type of kind of newly released documents. And then new, newly uh, released the facts about the, what actually happened during the authoritarian regime, like the torture cases or what happened during the Gwangju cases. So, you know, probably seen a lot of movies uh, about the Korean democratic movement, uh, you know, uh, based on these kind of aspects. And, and it has very good impact. But then also some novels, you know, I think the world renowned Nam Booker, uh, you know, the uh, uh, awardee Han Gang also wrote uh, something is called about, uh, about the Gwangju massacre. So I think that is how the people knew and then changed, especially, you know, I'm in the university. I talk to, you know, young students who are not used to those kind of authoritarian regimes and what really happened. And then they learn through those kind of novels and the films and then, you know, sometimes songs and then these things. Of course, you know, you have, have to have an infrastructure of the freedom of expression within the particular country in order to that should happen. But still, I think those are the another form of the communication that could happen and then in the long term, you know, has a more fundamental effect to the society. Yeah, I, I'd like to add that um, uh, to, to, this, um, to these comments that I think that probably in the 21st century, when we are talking about public communication, uh, we're not just talking about domestic audiences. Uh, we're also talking about international audiences. And sometimes it makes things very messy and very complicated. And, um, you know, thinking about, you know, good practices of communication that we mentioned, but also I'm thinking about some, some, some failures in communication. And uh, in the case of um, Lithuania, I can think of uh, an institution, a Lithuanian Genocide Research and Resistance Center, which is basically focusing uh, not so much just on transitional justice, but also on disrespective justice, um, looking into the crimes of the Soviet regime, looking at the crimes of the Nazi regime. But uh, recently there was this big scandal that became international because in a sense it was the lack of professional communication the professional the memo was not written by professional historians but by written by somebody who was not very sensitive to the ways in which the international community is accustomed to talking about the Holocaust um, and it became you know it became a big problem so I think um, the process of communication, um, again, um, successful process of communication takes into account the international audience as well and those international norms associated with retrospective justice, transitional justice that we have already seen. And it's extremely, I think, um, difficult to do. So not only you annoy domestic audience, but <laughs> you can also annoy international audience as well, which, which again, may lead to um, some, 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 some unpleasant, unpleasant experiences for those transitional justice institutions. So I 100% agree with that, but um, there are some caveats, which again, I'm going to cite another forthcoming book um, that I think will be soon available from Dr. Kelly Zvobga at the College of William and Mary. So she's, she's, uh, she already finished a book, but it's in um, the process of being published about the role of international NGOs and especially these transitional justice NGOs in essentially sanctioning whether a transitional justice event that took place, um, most of the time it's um, in the Southern hemisphere uh, or in Africa, whether it's, um, w whether it's acceptable and, legit and has international legitimacy or doesn't have it, international legitimacy. And basically, unless they are consulted and unless they help almost like frame the, 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 the mandate of the, of the Truth Commission and help set it up, it won't be given that mandate. So this leads to some paradoxical um, responses where uh, the transitional justice, it's, it's not clear that these transitional justice efforts are really sincere when it comes to dealing with the past, but they're sort of like more attempts to gain the, gain the approval of these international audiences. So I think this, the, you know, this illustrates that, you know, there can be sort of pathological um, consequences of this, you know, um, looking only towards the international audience, for instance. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, which is not to say that, you know, these international NGOs are not helpful because obviously they're, you know, they provide expertise and so on, but this, the, their ability to sanction or not, whether something really counts as a truth commission, I mean, I think that's, you know, that's something that is beginning to be problematic. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the discussion about the uh, um, transnational attempts at evaluation of transitional justice in the context of uh, of today's webinar, where we uh, deliberately sought to include these uh, various perspectives from uh, three case study countries. Well, we have uh, just five minutes left, so I would like to use my uh, privilege as a moderator to ask my question. Uh, one of the projects uh, that we are currently implementing at Taiwan National Foundation in cooperation with the National Democratic Institute is related to the intersection of gender mainstreaming and uh, expansion of LGBTQI plus rights and democratic resilience. And I'm aware of it in some cases where transitional justice proceedings have taken place. For example, in Colombia, um, there, have be, there has been a very focused attention on uh, the gendered peace and, and um, uh, dealing with atrocities that were targeting particular um, vulnerable and minority groups such as women and uh, LGBTQI plus individuals. So um, based on your um, experience in the cases of Poland, Lithuania and Korea, uh, could you comment on the extent and the success of transitional justice proceedings um, with regard to atrocities committed uh, against women and LGBTQI plus individuals? I think that in Poland, uh, one would be hard pressed to seek uh, specific uh, such measures. And the reason is that the resurgence of interest in transitional justice, which was in par part a response to the complete lack of transitional justice in the first years following uh, the transition, has come from a very populist and very nationalist uh, party, namely law and justice, which has actually, um, you know, lacking, as any populist party, populist parties need enemies. And uh, they created an enemy out of the LGBTQ community. So, uh, so I think probably when they leave power, there will be a need for transitional justice with respect to, uh, you know, those communities that have been that are currently being victimized by them. But so there is, I would say, there is a demand for such transitional justice once this regime that we currently have in Poland is over. Uh, but but I don't think there are any measures that were put in place. In fact, I would even you know venture to say that when it comes to women's rights, they were in better shape in some regards under communism than they are currently. And I'm thinking right now about reproductive rights, which are so severely cur curtailed in Poland that um, you know I, I I couldn't you know yeah. So that's a, that's another group that is currently being victimized. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think in the case of Lithuania, I would say that um, gender culture is changing a bit, um, even though, um, unfortunately, the gender aspect, I think, uh, I, I couldn't be able to identify it in transitional justice. But um, I'd like to mention this one recent development uh, in Lithuanian Genocide Research and Resistance Center. So. Uh, a project that they are starting would be to look at gender aspects of this anti-Soviet resistance movement. So, you know, where were the women during this war? Uh, what were they doing? Were they active combatants or not, right? Um, and this is new. <laughs> this, this, you know, this basically gender dimension was missing completely from the debates about the past, uh, whether communist or not communist. And then also there are some works by Lithuanian scholars like Bela Leinerte, in which uh, in, in her recent book, she's trying to uh, retrace the status of women, um, the problematic related to gender relations during the Soviet times. But um, again, um, unfortunately, especially when it comes to LGBT community, this is kind of simply has not been addressed adequately yet in Lithuania. Um, and although uh, just similarly to a case in Poland, right, transitional justice was very much uh, started by uh, right-wing parties, but I think that as the time went on, um, Lithuania did not follow <laughs> Poland's example in this case. So I think uh, when it comes to reproductive rights and women's rights, 
the situation is a bit better. But um, specifically when it comes to attempts to deal with the past, again, unfortunately, gender dimension is still still missing. Okay, uh, let me add two, two, yeah, two issues uh, in South Korea relating to the gender issues. I think the first thing is that uh, you know, I think the, the the identification of the gender-related violence, I think it will come as a society, awareness of the society increases over time. So South Korean case, the first, uh, the killings and then the you know, torture and disappearance came first. But I think as time passes and the people are aware, the gender-related violence becomes the issue and then more victims are coming out. Uh, so I think that is the one uh, aspect. So we have to wait until the society the levels of the aware, social awareness and then the victim's awareness of the issue becomes a more a more ripe in the society. And then the second one is that uh, I think uh, in Korean case, especially the women, um, uh, the, the, the dealing with the trauma, and then because the most vi victims were male and then the, the, the people who were left over were the, were the women. And then uh, uh, the, the trauma issues has been recently focused and then how to deal with that uh, medically, uh, uh, and then uh, how to, to deal with, support them uh, has been a big issue. So I think trauma, uh, treatment of the trauma and then the issue has been another uh, aspect of the, the transitional justice uh, in South Korea. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your insights. Unfortunately, uh, the time is up. Uh, I really appreciate your time and your willingness to join us this morning or, or this evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that uh, today's discussion will provide a lot of food for thought, not only for our Taiwanese audience members, but also to um, people from around the world who are interested in transitional justice and human rights issues more broadly. Um, please uh, do follow Taiwan National Foundation on social media. We are on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and also on YouTube. Um, this is the first episode of our series, and we are planning on uh, releasing the second episode in March, so um, keep in touch uh, so you can join the second episode. And uh, once again, thank you very much for joining us, and I wish you all a, a very happy, a very safe uh, New Year of the Tiger. <laughs> thank you, thank you bye so bye. much for organizing, and wonderful to uh, meet you, Professor Budrita, and see you again, Hanjan. It's been, uh, I think, three years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was really a great experience. Thank you, everybody. It was very, very interesting. Thank you, Martin, for inviting us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.